Um, I'll hand it over to you now, Mike. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, good morning, and thank you for uh, inviting me to talk about my new. And it's a new journey into Parkinson's disease for me. Uh, my name is Mike Scales, and to repeat a little bit of what Alana said, I'm 70 years of age. I was diagnosed with Parkinson's last September 2020. I immigrated to Canada with my wife and son in November 1977 and resided in Coquitlam ever since. So about 18 months ago, I noticed I was having a loss of sensation in my ring and middle finger of my left hand, and my left wrist was getting stiff, uh, which at the time I put down to a possible sporting injury. Uh, I noticed that playing my guitar and my drums became more difficult and I was bumping into the wall occasionally when turning around corners in the house. I'm also my left hand was starting to tremor. So I went to my family doctor of over 40 years who was familiar with my love of physical activity and he put it down to a minor injury to my left elbow which had occurred about three months earlier. He told me it was nothing to worry about and to be careful he thought the walking into walls was due to age, and he also did it sometimes. <laughs> a few weeks later, I went back to the doctor as I wanted a reassessment. He sent me off to get my upper back and neck x-rayed, and I had a CT scan of my brain. The CT scan was normal, but the x-ray showed some arthritis in the vertebrae of my neck, so he referred me to the physio who has treated me for sports injuries over the years. She's used to me, anyway, she's used to seeing me, so she knew my, my uh, physiology quite well. And she treated my neck and noticed my left hand was trembling while she was doing it. I told her what the doctor had said, and she immediately thought it was Parkinson's and suggested I see a neurologist. So, back to the doctor for a referral. I went to see the neurologist and it was about six months into the condition. The neurologist gave me some tests, of which I scored five out of five in all. He also asked me if I'd suffered a trauma to my left elbow. I told him I had injured it about six months prior in a martial arts practice session, but not seriously. At the time, he could not say conclusively it was Parkinson's and sent me home with an elbow brace to wear, which kept my arm straight when I slept. And that was in order to let the nerves heal. So at this stage, we still thought it could be a trauma to the uh, ulnar nerve. Six months later, I went back to neurologist for another consultation. This time he gave me more tests and finally diagnosed I had symptoms of Parkinson's with a resting tremor in my left hand. I was devastated and felt very confused. Not me, Mr. Action Man, he can't be right, that's what I thought, but he was. Now what to do? Welcome to the world of levodopa. From my teenage years, bit of history here. In the teenage years, I was a high level junior swimming competitor in Britain and won various championships. I played rugby for the town I lived in and started karate and jiu-jitsu in 1968. I presently hold the rank of eighth down black belt in karate and third down in Okinawan Kobudo, which is study of the ancient Okinawan weapons. And I've taught these ever since coming to Canada. I do weight training and walk with my wife, ride the stationary bike. I stretch and practice martial arts almost daily. What has all this got to do with the personal journey with Parkinson's? Well, Having been in athletic endeavours all my life and martial arts, I have had broken bones, muscle, tendon and ligament injuries and two mild concussions in the 60s. I'm used to dealing with injuries and diligently rehabbing and getting better as soon as possible so I could get back to my training. But when I was told I had Parkinson's, I had to accept it would never leave me. I would most likely get worse. It knocked me completely sideways and I felt very depressed about it. And I'm not a person that gets depressed. My father had Parkinson's and passed away at the age of 75. But although it's not what took his life, it certainly contributed to his declining health. So I thought, wow, he was only five years older than I am now. Maybe I did not have long myself. And I started to have irrational thoughts and the feeling for the first time in my life, mortal. The internet can be both helpful and informative, but also scary. Whilst researching Parkinson's, I read that I could end up suffering from erectile dysfunction, constipation, a lack of uh, smell and taste, to name but a few. I also read I should consult the vehicle licensing office to tell them of my new condition. I did so, and they informed me to go to the doctor in order to assess me to be able to continue driving. All okay there. I now started to have disturbed sleep the first time because I've always been a really sound sleeper. So I had to get organized and learn how to live with Parkinson's and fight it. I initially struggled with the medication and my diet. I couldn't seem to balance the meal times with the levodopa. I, I finally sorted this out. 
It did not help, <coughs> excuse me, it did not help when I told family and friends about me suffering with Parkinson's, as the standard reply seems to be, oh, Mike, I'm so sorry. Oh, I'm really sorry. It's as though it's a death sentence. So, of course, it scared me a bit more. I needed help and support, and I found it in the Parkinson's Society. I have nothing but praise for the Parkinson's Society. I am so impressed with the amount of information and webinars that are available to us. I feel totally supported by this wonderful society and I've made many new friends. Going forward now, I could sit around feeling sorry for myself or do what I've always done, fight. To my surprise and delight, all the webinars I've attended regarding how to manage Parkinson's exercise is right at the top to relieve this, help relieve the symptoms. Now I'm lucky because for me, this is easy. Exercise is already part of my daily life. I've even upped my workouts and during the pandemic, I'm now teaching three Zoom karate classes per week as we cannot get to use the gym. I'm determined to do whatever I can to control my condition with activities that employ both mind and body, as I definitely feel so much better after a workout or play my guitar and drums. Not long after I was diagnosed with Parkinson's, I attended a very informative webinar on CBD oil, which was hosted by the Parkinson's Society. After the webinar, I contacted the recommended cannabis doctor in Victoria, BC for a consultation and after a very detailed assessment, the doctor felt I could be a candidate to use CDB oil to help me alleviate some of the symptoms of Parkinson's. I now take CBD oil three times a day. The daytime dose of very little THC is to help me with pain and stiffness. The evening dose with a higher level of content to THC is to help me sleep. I definitely feel less rigidity in my left hand. My knees feel better, I am calmer, and I sleep sounder. Although there is some amazing research being done to find a cure for Parkinson's disease, thank you, Michael J. Fox, and by the way, if you've not read his books, do so. It seems to be a disease that most people know very little about until they actually get it themselves. I'd like to see more awareness about Parkinson's to help the general public understand what we're going through, and I'd certainly volunteer my help in any way I can to do that. I'm lucky to have a wonderful wife for 48 years. After I was diagnosed, she immediately said in her usual tough way, we'll deal with this together. I now do not feel so alone. I have a very supportive family, friends, students, and a lot to live for. I firmly believe a positive mind, love, and a support group go a long way to help fight this disease. Once again, thank you to the Parkinson Society. Thank you. Over to Gina, I think now. Thank you, Mike. That's a really beautiful um, journey. And it, I didn't realize that you were so newly diagnosed. And I mean, within the year, and I I just, I'm kind of stunned at how um, positive you are at, and how recent your diagnosis is. I mean, it didn't, I, I couldn't wrap my head around this for a long time. Definitely not within like six months or less than a year. I don't think, I still don't think I have my head wrapped around it, but, um, Certainly within the first year of diagnosis, I, I felt really lost and like, um, you know, was just searching, like compulsively searching for information and for guidance, you know. So I really, I really admire you for um, being able to speak out and open about this and, and so candidly, so soon after diagnosis. So anyway, uh, my name's Gina. Um, I'm now 43. I was, I think, diagnosed when I was around 36. And um, my journey started, I guess, in November of 2013 when I admitted myself to the hospital because I had really bad flu. Um, my pulse was down to like 30 beats per minute or something ridiculous. And once I was admitted to the hospital with this flu or this, I don't know, bacterial flu or what, but it was flu-like symptoms, really bad flu-like symptoms. And um, once they hydrated me, I started coughing. And then once I started coughing, they did a chest x-ray and saw I had this crazy pneumonia that is apparently not really common among young people um, or people with normal immune systems. If you're like severely immunocompromised, I guess it's more common. So the, the ER doctor basically said to me, I don't think, I was delirious, I was completely out of it. And I remember her saying, I don't think you understand the severity of this. This doesn't happen to people your age. And um, you gotta, you gotta re-examine your lifestyle if you make it out of here <laughs> alive. Um, and I just basically said, all right, well, this problem's in your hands right now. Uh, I'm going to go to sleep if I can. Um, but after I got out, I rested for about three weeks in December. And then in January of 2014, I noticed that my I was playing a snare drum 
with this um, community percussion band. And I noticed my right arm wouldn't articulate. It was really um, ratcheted. And I didn't notice the movement until I heard the sound was really messed up. And I looked down and I thought, oh, maybe I'm just out of practice for a couple of weeks. You know, it was the holidays. I just got out of the hospital pneumonia. My body's a little stiff. And then I just noticed as the class went on, as the rehearsal session went on, it wasn't loosening up, it wasn't changing, and it was there was something really, really different. So I called my doctor and I went, I got a referral to a neurologist, I think in July of that year, I met with the neurologist, so six months later. And I think by that time he had done a um uh, an MRI. Maybe my I don't remember, this was so long ago, I don't remember. There, by the time I got to the, the neurologist, there was an MRI in his hand, and he said there there were 22 areas of hyper intense activity. And my mother, she was with me at the time, and she sat there with her arms crossed, and she said, hmm, I could have told you that. And um, <laughs> so, but like all jokes aside, they didn't know if it was MS or what. So they referred me over to the brain, Center for Brain Health at UBC. And long story short, about, I guess, two years later, I after being considered for MS and for stroke, Parkinson's, and then back to... I think, I think back to the stroke doctor, it was, I got bumped around a couple of times. Nobody could really figure out where I belonged. My symptoms weren't um, too strong at the time. They were pretty light, pretty subtle. And, but they were, they were definitely clear. There, were, there was something going on. We just didn't know what it was. Um, but going, flashing forward to June of 2016, they settled on Parkinson's diagnosis. So at that point, um, they, sure, I felt a lot of shock confusion, um, but I also felt a great sense of relief because I now knew what the heck was going on and at least had a name to connect with, you know, what was going on with my body and I could start my research from there. And so I so I started taking the dopamine replacement therapy at the end of June 2016. And um and I I had I'd already been scheduled to just for fun co MC a music festival in Vancouver a month later. So it's um it, it, was, it was interesting when I look back and make a timeline of my life throughout the Parkinson's journey, there was always um, really good stuff going on and then really, really terrible stuff going on at the same time. And the one thing I've noticed over the past, I guess, I don't know, what is it, seven, eight years, um, is that like when there were times where the stress level was high, either because of my personal life or because of work, um, my symptoms all are flared up. And they got worse. And those, and until now, I finally stepped back and realized the role of, of stress or exercise plays in, in symptoms. But at the time, when um, you know, when I would experience a sudden, sudden uh, flare-up of symptoms, I didn't realize that the connection between the amount I was exercising and the, really the level of stress in my life, how that was, how that was affecting the symptom flare-up. So um, I don't, you know, it's been quite a few years into the journey. I don't think I have it all figured out just yet, but I, I think I um, have I've developed like a, a recipe or formula that's that keeps me going and makes me feel good. Um, but you know, with this disease, we don't know if what's around the corner if if um, it'll start progressing rapidly or if it um, if it will just stay put and progress very slowly throughout our lives. So um, you know, trying to just stay healthy. Um, follow the, the the recipe that that I know works for me so far, and then be open to learning new things and trying new things to to further manage symptoms. So, if um if you if anybody has any questions or comments or wants to just share something with me that they think I should try, feel free to get in touch with me afterwards, or um, or even during. I guess we're gonna have a Q and A period at the end of the seminar. And now I want to pass the mic over to Debbie Hartley. Okay, and here I am. So it was interesting listening to your early diagnosis symptoms and everything. And it's interesting when you're first diagnosed, it's like, what is that? And you're, you're thinking, yeah, I don't know. Anyways, I've been diagnosed for eight years. Um, and I actually have been very determined not to let Parkinson's get in my way of my life. Although it, it's getting a little bit more in there. So um, now my days are kind of, I divide them into attitude, fortitude, and gratitude. Uh, 
because I know that I could just sit at home and feel sorry for myself, but that's not really an option. And uh, like real life is hard. It really is. So you just got to get on with it. What was I expecting to just breeze out of here? And, um, and truly, I'm grateful for so many things in my life. So that helps me get through each day. Um, it's kind of like Parkinson's is an uninvited guest. It came over for coffee and it stayed for a long time. <laughs> it's here forever, actually. So I wasn't really surprised, though, when I got my diagnosis because my mother also had Parkinson's and her twin sister had it. And it really does run in our family. I've had a DNA test and I have that marked gene, which is all, almost gratifying to know that I have. That's the reason, I think. Anyways, um, as soon as I got Parkinson's, I thought I got to get down to this. I, I can't just let it rule my life. I've just retired. My husband and I have been traveling and I wanted to continue all of that. And I didn't want people to feel sorry for me. So I only told my family, my very close family, which is small, and I told just a very few number of friends. And that's it. And other than that, I still don't tell people I have Parkinson's, whether they're a new person on the block or, um, or just they've known me for a long time, like my book club members don't know. And if I tremor while I'm talking about the book, well, that's just the way it is. So um, I also, interestingly, a few months, we had just moved to Kelowna not, not so long ago from then. And a few months after that diagnosis, I noticed in the local newspaper that there was a Parkinson support group locally. So we decided, my husband and I decided, well, we'll go. And we, it was start to start at seven o'clock in a church hall. We showed up at five to seven. There were about 60 people in that room and I was very warmly welcomed at the door. We, um, there was an information section to that meeting and then there was also coffee and cake and, and uh, goodies afterwards. So, and socializing which really helped me a lot. And then it also introduced me to Parkinson Society BC, to whom I refer to as the mothership all the time. Uh, I like to be informed. I, knowing about something helps me cope with it. So the more I could learn about Parkinson's, the better off I was and the less my anxiety was. So I went on the internet, of course, and Dr. Google was a very good friend of mine. She dragged me right into the abyss of knowing all about PD. Um, and that was a good thing, actually, because the more I learned, the less my anxiety was. So that was super helpful. However, I didn't really want to be this passive host to PD, so I had to know more and what I could do. So, um, also, in 2016, there was the Parkinson, World Parkinson Congress in um, uh, Portland and that was close enough for us to drive so off we go it was unbelievable I if anybody gets a chance to ever attend a World Parkinson Congress no matter where it is it's in um, Barcelona in 2022 um, it's fantastic the, the there's there was about 5,000 registrants plus all the presenters they were doctors pharmaceuticals um, what have I got here um, studies, research, we could get involved in so much stuff. Plus we had a, we actually filled a suitcase full of books and all the giveaways from that uh, conference. It was fantastic. To stay on top of things, I also subscribed to lots of websites like Michael J. Fox, David Finney, um, uh, the World Congress. I'm, I'm on lots of those feeds and you can get lots of information that way. I also have volunteered for a few research projects, and that helps me too. I'll never know the results of each specific project, but you know, to, to uh, contribute to the greater good is a good thing. And maybe one day they'll find a cure or at least something to stop it in its tracks. Um, I also want to keep on going. I don't want to stop. And as the disease progresses, you know, you have to take a little bit more medication, but I do, I do. And um, I also have a sense of humor sometimes when I'm on a, in an off time, I'll walk around the house going, oh, oh, oh robot, but that's just the way it is. Um, but I know I have the work to do. I have to stay fit. 
and healthy and informed and engaged, and I'm working on it. I got my notes here. So it's harder to do the work now after eight years, but I do it. And I, the, the thing I'm really committed to is exercise, for sure. Um, I just sort of feel that I've never been an athlete, believe me, not at all. But I do like to walk, and I like to be outside, and I like to hike, and my husband likes to hike. I don't snowshoe anymore. I don't cycle anymore. I don't ski anymore. But there's still stuff I can do and I will do. Um, I do yoga. I was before COVID, I was doing three fitness classes a week, plus two yoga classes. And now I have to be sort of more disciplined to take that on myself, but I do. Also, the theory of brain plasticity really, um, really helped me understand that I could carve out new avenues in my brain if I kept doing an exercise or an activity. So, and it's really helped me. Like I, I know I'm a, I'm, I've got Parkinson's, but I also know I can live with it. So that's really a good thing for me. Uh, and I'm quite vain, I have to admit. So <laughs> I know. So just to, just thinking that there's this invisible audience out there, things you know, it makes me sit up straight and uh, try and act normal as much as I can. I do get tired, though. I do get tremors. I do get stiffness. That's just the way it is, you know, and you just deal with it and carry on. So um, I have to admit that after public pretending, I'm, I realize I'm moving towards the middle of it all stage. And I've learned not to make apologies for my tremor or my wiggling or my handwriting or needing rest. You just have to take care of yourself too. I find that really empowering to know I can do that. I've also feel more centered if I have routine in my day. So I am the to-do list lady. And I used to be able to do a daily to-do list. I still do a daily to-do list, but Parkinson's make me take a whole week to finish that daily to-do list. That's the way it is. And, you know, in many ways, COVID has been a blessing for us because we've sort of slowed down our schedule and not has many have had as many commitments. And you know what, let's let you reflect on what's really important in your life and what you can let go of. So, and in terms of this gratitude thing, I've always read that you should keep a gratitude journal, write three things down at the end of the day for which you're really great, grateful. And I've tried that, but I can't limit it to three. So this is my gratitude list. I, my family, primarily focused. My husband is just a fabulous partner and my children are here in Kelowna, so I'm very grateful. I live in Canada where I have access to good health care and it doesn't matter how much money is in my bank account. I'm part of the local support group and that helps me get to know people personally who have issues also a, uh, a women's um, a support group. We call ourselves the Good Vibrations. There's 14 of us. And I'm also grateful for the internet because it helps me access information. Also deeply grateful for Zoom because, because of COVID. Who knew about Zoom? Not me, not a word until COVID came around. And now it's a noun and it's a verb and it's a platform for communication. Like who knew? So I have three quotes that I have on above my desk and on my fridge. One is about attitude. Attitude is a thing, a little thing, but it makes a big difference. Fortitude in action allows us to face fear and conquer it. And gratitude turns what we have into enough. So those three quotes help me a lot. And Mark, I think it's your turn next. So you are going to speak on being the care partner. We look forward to this. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie, so, so very much. Uh, it's great listening to you all. You know, obviously you all come from, speak from different angles, different perspectives, and I come from a completely different perspective uh, now as I, as I share with you uh, about being a, a care partner. Uh, as we've heard and as we all know, as we hear all the time, life 
uh, with Parkinson's is different for everybody. And that's the same for caregiving. Uh, if it's different for everybody with living with PD, being a care partner is different for everybody. I think one of the key things is that we all need to adapt and live with it. Um, for me, one of the key things that I've learned from the outset is that it's not just Angela who has the PD. Yeah, I'm also affected by that. What I mean by that is that we're in this together. Yes, Angela personally and physically lives with the PD. I live with Angela. I walk beside her. I, I also need to adapt to my life. And that's not a bad thing. It, it's not a negative. It is what it is. We need to adapt and we make the most of life. And so, you know, life is different now since Angela was diagnosed with uh, young onset Parkinson's. Angela has lived with PD now for 13 years since her official diagnosis. That means that I also have. Yeah, I remember the specialist saying to me at the time of diagnosis, the best thing for Angela is that she needs to have a very stable and steady, stress-free life. Poor Angela. She's married to me. A bit, a bit like Mike, you know, fast-paced, high energy, the drive, the move, the shaker. It creates stress. Yeah, that's me. Um, however, I am still me, and I have tried to adapt. Um, I love my wife, and I want to support her. And I would say one of the hardest things for me over the past 13 years is that I, I cannot fix it. I know that's a male thing. However, I've got rather frustrated with myself over the years that I cannot fix this PD. I just can't fix it. Yeah, I'm a naturally, I'm a positive person. And, and coming to the reality that I can't fix the PD, I try to focus on seeing well, what can I do? supporting, encouraging, and empowering. So looking at supporting, where, where possible, do things together, go for walks. We've heard a lot this morning about exercise, how exercise is so important and how we need to do that. Well, yeah, I try my best to do the best I can in going for walks and, and doing some exercise. And, and uh, Shelley, if you're listening, I've been doing some of your exercises just recently. Um, I do them with Angela. We need to be there to practically support. With PD, the, the body does not always do what you want it to do. You that live with it know that all too well. As a caregiver, be there to practically support. Be the extra helping hand. However, it is important, and, and I have fallen short at times, don't try to do everything. As caregivers, we're there to support. Support, key word, not take over. You know, in supporting, I, I try to do things personally that may help Angela and the wider PD community. For me, this has been uh, in the area of advocacy. And for all those with PD in BC, I want to try and advocate the best I can. I have and, and I will continue to, to raise the awareness of DBS and the benefits of DBS and, and how our province needs to do more to increase uh, DBS surgeries. Again, I, I can't fix it, but I can do something. And as a caregiver, it's important for me to do something. We're all different. You all need to do something as caregivers uh, do something, find something that works for you. Do something that helps support your loved one. Remembering, you know, you're in this together. How can I encourage Angela? Well, as I said, I, we're in this together. So first and foremost, that's an important thing to remember. We are in this together. Simple little things are important, you know. Have you taken your pills? Have you got those reminders set? I think it's important that we affirm, you know, I affirm what Angela's doing. You're doing a great job and, and I admire your efforts and the, your, your stamina, your drive. I'm not trying to be patronizing at all here. However, I really do believe those little regular words of encouragement 
are important. They're important for all of us. And as I encourage, as I also um, I feel very inside as I encourage, we're in this together. If Angela is doing well, so am I as a caregiver. Empowering is again important as a caregiver. As your loved one continues to live with this degenerative disease, what can we do? Similar to encouraging as a caregiver, I try where possible to help Angela and encourage her to be more confident uh, as to you know, as she lives with PD. Yes, PD is debilitating, but we as caregivers love our loved ones. We need to do all we can to help them just to be as confident as possible. Stay in the public and, 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 and be out there and do what you can to be uh, encouraging them. Encouraging them to take control of their lives and not allow, as we've heard so much this morning, don't allow that PD to, to control your lives. I will not allow it to. It's so important. To help us all to continue to, to be stronger as we all live with the PD. So life is perhaps different, and now we've heard that again this morning. Life is different now from when it was. So for us, life is different. It may be slower. It is slower. That doesn't mean giving up. I would say that Angela and I have, and uh, we do triumph through living with this PD. We enjoy as much as possible to spend time with our family and our grandchildren. Have fun. We love to travel. We did a lot of traveling, and, and I'm convinced that we will be able to do some more traveling sometime soon. Uh, I really do hope so, and we see more of the world. Because there may come a time when we can't do quite as much. The key thing is adapt and adjust, always trying to find a way. I, I personally feel that you don't ever need to give up on anything physically, emotionally, or practically as a couple. However, you do and you will need to adapt to find a new way to make things work. Angela and I have, and, and we will continue to do so. Walt Disney said, if you can dream it, you can do it. I so believe that. Yes, we live with PD. Yes, life changes, as your loved one is perhaps not as mobile and is in more pain or discomfort and isn't quite as flexible as physical as they were. Adjust. Adjust. Yes, it can be challenging at times, but adjust and find a way to adapt. As caregivers, always see the good. Support, encourage, and empower. As Walt said, if you can dream it, you can do it. Never, ever give up. Always adapt and enjoy life today and just make the most of it. Thanks for this time for sharing with you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, all of our speakers, Gina, Mark, Debbie, Mike. Thank you so much for speaking today and sharing your stories with us and imparting um, some very important and insightful messages for our viewers.